2016, I signed up 26.8 acres for the pollinator program, and uh, we had soybeans on it that year, which is what is probably most ideal, and then you, you don't till it, you just leave it. And then, uh, I think it was end of February, first part of March, we seeded with, Larson Co-op seeded with an airflow, the big wings out. Uh, that was much easier than me going out there with a 10-foot drill. And uh, it worked really good. They, you have to put 200 pounds an acre of fertilizer just to get the seed so it flows good. And uh, then the first year, uh, we mowed it twice for weeds. And then uh, last year, you're, you have, it's kind of optional to mow it if there is weeds, but we really didn't have a lot of weeds. And now this is the third year. So, again, I apologize for the wet conditions and everything's behind. We expected when we signed this date up, we'd have lots of flowers and there's not really a lot, but you can see a lot of the, the greens coming and uh, thought I'd have a lot of corn growing and soybeans, but I've got a lot of weeds. I didn't plant any crops this year. I've got 300 acres and I think I got 40 acres of winter wheat left. So that's it. So anyway, I got weeds for cover crop and <laughs> when we get out to the pollinator fields, we have a few flowers. When we do a pollinator planting, we, we like to have things that bloom in early summer, mid summer and late. So right now there's only two things flowering. It's the Golden Alexander and Foxglove Beard Tongue, also known as uh, Tall Penstemon. Um, there's other things we have labeled out here. There's no flowers on them. Those are the things that will be flowering in mid to late summer. The object of that is to have something that provides nectar to the pollinators year, you know, throughout the summer rather than everything flower at once and then be done, um, just to provide a constant supply of food. To add to that, for example, bumblebees have, um, they come out in about late April, May, and their colony goes all the way until September. And so that resource is critical for them throughout the whole growing season for them to continue um, being able to get resources to make more workers and then produce new females for next year. You know, the three things that you need to do in order to have a successful prairie are good site prep. Spend your time on site prep. Even if you're like, oh, I really want to get this in the ground, spend your time on really good site prep. So site prep, don't plant your seeds too deep. These seeds, very expensive and very fine, some of them, a quarter to a half inch is uh, the deepest we want those seeds when planted. So that's important. And then the third thing um, that uh, Glenn has done and talked about was those maintenance mowings. I usually recommend three maintenance mowings in the first growing season and then um, one to two in the second. And it really depends, like Glenn was saying, what's coming up to is if you need to do that many. But folks who don't do any, their prairie takes longer to really get established. Those mowings help to get that sunlight to the soil surface. So back to site prep. Um, you know, some landowners don't have um, a, a crop field that they're putting their prairie into. It's really nice to have a soybean field that you, like Glenn did, you know, he broadcasted that over the top. That site prep is good, or you, I mean, you could come and and just you know work it like you would for a crop field and plant on top of that as well. So there's many there's many options and it really just depends your site and your availability with with equipment and and resources you have. So um, so site prep site prep don't plant too deep and then do your maintenance mowings. Really help to have a very successful prairie. Something else to add to Julie, and you know, we're not putting them really in CRP plantings, but in that early season, people forget about shrubs are really important yep. for pollinators. Um, you know, spring ephemeral plants, so in our woodlands, those areas, that's really where a lot of these uh, pollinators are going in that time of the year, because that's really where the things are flowering. So it's just another component to think about um, with that. You know, when we talk about management, it's really certain groups of species benefit from mowing, certain groups of species benefit from burning. One thing to think about on sites, and I don't know, this goes into the burn plan process, is leaving refugia for some of those species, like 
say you have monarchs on that site and they um, have their caterpillars, if you're going to run a late fire through, you could be toasting them out. But they need the habitat too, so it's this constant balancing act of um, maintaining habitat, but then also leaving areas for them to recolonize from. So it's just something to keep in the back of your mind when you're doing those plans. And I know the um, planners really do a good job on that. So. This site, it, it's, we could leave some refugia because there, it's such a big site. And these are big fields. Some people have really small acres. Right. And when you get a contractor out there to burn, let them burn it all. It, it's, it's more but beneficial for res your resource dollars, you know? So it, it, every project has a lot of different you know, <clears throat> decisions to make. And what's nice is USDA and Pheasants Forever and Fish and Wildlife DNR folks are available to help you with those decisions. Mm -hmm.